administration. And I would like to thank you, Jason, and the Bipartisan Policy Center for giving me an opportunity to share my closing remarks and engage uh, when I have literally 24 hours left, left to go. Um, as I reflect upon my tenure, I was actually taken aback by a stark fact. More than one half of my tenure, 100, exactly 100 of the, of the 164 weeks that I served as FDIC chairman has been under the declaration of the national emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, as you mentioned, the FDIC is no stranger to crises. It is an institution born of crises that has successfully managed many crises since our founding in 1933. I knew that going into this job, we could, hypothetically speaking, have a crisis on our, on, of some kind. What I could not possibly have anticipated was that the crisis would have, um, we would have on our hands would be unlike any other the FDIC has endured in its history. And while no life experience can fully prepare a person for one of these jobs, let alone a job of running an agency tasked with maintaining financial stability in the middle of unprecedented instability caused by a global pandemic, some life experiences are indeed very useful. And uh, I have to tell you, last summer, as I was commemorating my 30th anniversary of having immigrated to the United States, I could not help but reflect on the moment when I first landed at San Francisco airport on my 18th birthday with $500 in my pocket. Now, my story is not different from that of many uh, of the tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to breathe free, who see the United States as a land of opportunity. And like millions before me and millions after me, when you arrive in the United States with very little and struggle to survive, you quickly learn three things. Take nothing for granted. Our freedoms, opportunities, hopes, and dreams are unique and achievable. Learn as much as you can about everything. Knowledge is power and once acquired, an obligation. And be flexible. The only constant is change, and change necessitates agility. That is how I approached my role at the FDIC in 2018, long before the onset of the pandemic. I wanted to learn how did we get to the set of issues before us? What could a banking regulator do to foster a resilient and competitive financial system that enables people from all walks of life to achieve their American dream? So I will start with financial stability. The FDIC was established to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. While March and April of 2020 may seem like a distant memory now, back then the crisis was shocking in its severity and speed. The economy entered into the deepest recession in the post-World War II era, contracting 31.2% in the second quarter on an annualized basis. We lost 22.4 million jobs in those two months. The S&P 500 index plummeted 33.6% by March 20th from its recent high. Liquidity in U.S. Treasury markets deteriorated rapidly, and many other markets came under significant stress. The story of how our financial regulators, central banks, and the global financial system responded to the pandemic is one of great success. Only three banks failed since the start of the pandemic, and none due to the pandemic itself. At the FDIC, we took a broad array of actions to maintain stability in financial markets and provide flexibility to allow banks to work with their customers and support the economic recovery. We worked hand in hand with our regulatory counterparts in a coordinated fashion and with remarkable speed to prevent the shock of the pandemic from irreparably damaging our economy and banking system. Technology was an incredible asset. The FDIC and the institutions we regulate were able to transition to a remote working environment literally overnight, yet financial markets continue to function and FDIC exams proceeded as scheduled. We closed a failed bank in the early weeks of the pandemic using an entirely new playbook, and we sent only 10 employees on site rather than the usual 70. Even throughout the pandemic, we have continued to prioritize improving supervision and resolution planning for large banks. In 2019, I announced the creation of a new division, the Division of Complex Institution Supervision and Resolution, to centralize for the first time our supervision and resolution activities for the largest banks. Combining resolution and supervision allows information, resources, and expertise to be shared in advance and to be readily available in the event of a crisis. We have also continued to improve resolution readiness. The U.S. Global Systemically Important Banking Organizations, or the GSIPs, have implemented significant structural and operational improvements that have enhanced their resolvability in bankruptcy. We have remained focused 
on ensuring that firms continue to enhance, test, and operationalize their capabilities and systems to implement an orderly resolution if needed. We have also further built out our own resolution capabilities at the FDIC, including by conducting a series of operational exercises to practice carrying out key resolution functions. The FDIC has also modified its approach to resolution planning for regional banks. The modified approach places greater focus on direct engagement with firms and capabilities testing while streamlining content requirements for resolution plans. We implemented a record keeping rule which requires large banks to configure their IT systems to calculate the insured and uninsured amount in each deposit account to help ensure that the FDIC can deliver timely payments to depositors if a large bank were to pay. In April of 2021, the 25 largest banks came into compliance with this rule and while more work remains to be done, they have been able to demonstrate the ability to deliver an insurance determination for the vast majority of their deposit accounts. The FDIC recently simplified the deposit insurance rules for trust accounts to facilitate a quicker and less burdensome resolution if a bank with a large number of trust accounts, trust accounts were to fail. In 2008, when IndyMac Bank failed, FDIC claims personnel needed to contact more than 10,500 depositors to obtain the necessary trust documentation. Rocco. This process took several months to complete, during which a large number of insured depositors could not access insured funds. We also devoted substantial time to addressing the significant challenges the FDIC might face if a bank holding deposit accounts from numerous large prepaid card programs were to fail. Although FDIC board members were unable to reach agreement on a path forward, given the increased popularity of prepaid card products, particularly among lower income households, this is an issue that continues to warrant attention by the FDIC. Important preparations also continue to enhance the FDIC's readiness if it is ever called upon to resolve non-bank firms such as central counterparties or CCPs. CCPs play a critical role in the financial system. Their clearing services are central to U.S. financial markets. And accordingly, we have been keenly focused on resolution outcomes that avoid or mitigate serious adverse effects on U.S. financial stability and ensure that CCP's critical services remain available. The FDIC has continued to engage with domestic and international counterparts to further develop policies and resolution strategies for CCP resolution. This work remains a priority at the Financial Stability Board's Resolution Steering Group, where I recently served as chair. We have continued to prioritize the importance of strong capital levels, particularly at our nation's largest banks. The lead depository institutions of the eight United States GSIBs grew their capital levels over the last several years despite stressful economic conditions, owing to rigorous capital requirements that were in place entering this period. The weighted average CET1 capital ratio of these institutions increased from 12.9% in the third quarter of 2018 to 14.5% as of the third quarter of 2021. Capital adequacy remains robust across the broader industry as well, including in the community banking sector. This strong capital position allowed the banking industry to serve as a source of strength to help individuals and small businesses navigate through the economic stress generated by the pandemic. Looking forward, as the banking agencies consider modifications to the regulatory capital rules pursuant to the so-called Basel III endgame, Careful consideration should be given to the strong capital levels currently in place across the banking system, including at the largest banks. I'm hopeful that revisions to the capital framework will reduce complexity and rationalize the many calculations necessary to determine capital adequacy. Similarly, these modifications should be thoughtfully incorporated to minimize advantages or disadvantages to banks of different sizes or different business models and the agencies should be mindful of any additional burdens imposed on small banks. The banking system is healthy, and this reality should be a key consideration as the agencies weigh revisions to the capital framework. I will now turn to competition, innovation, and inclusion, 
the guiding principles of my chairmanship that helped forge the most vibrant financial market in the world. From day one of my tenure, we set out on an aggressive agenda to ensure the FDIC's policies, supervisory approach, and engagement strategy supported these goals. Enhancing competition in the financial services marketplace is more than just looking at the number of banks in the United States. It requires looking deeply at the pressure on banks to scale, the costs of IT modernization, regulatory compliance costs, the rise of non-bank competitors, and the changing expectations of customers. We embarked on a number of initiatives to address these deeper issues. To encourage the Novo activity, we took several actions, including revising our process for reviewing deposit insurance proposals to provide initial feedback to organizers on draft applications prior to submission. During my tenure, the FDIC has approved deposit insurance applications for 49 de novo banks, compared to just 10 approvals between January 1st of 2011 and June 5th of 2018. Innovation is the critical ingredient that fosters both a competitive banking sector and one that supports financial inclusion by democratizing finance. More competitions spurs new products and services and cuts costs for those products, increasing consumer access to the financial system. We created FDI Tech, an innovation lab and a collaborative forum for regulators and the private sector to better understand new technologies identify regulatory impediments to innovation, and create solutions to specific challenges through tax prints. Our first rapid phase prototyping competition focused on providing regulators with more timely and granular access to bank data, and these creative solutions will soon be tested in a pilot program. Innovation requires a significant investment of resources, from procurement and deployment of technologies to hiring and training a skilled workforce. Independently developing and deploying new technologies can be difficult for community banks because of economies of scale. That is why partnering with a FinTech that has already developed, tested, and rolled out new technology can be critical for a small bank. Yet the onboarding and due diligence process can be costly and time consuming. In July of 2020, we proposed a public-private organization to establish standards for due diligence of vendors and their technologies. The FDIC would participate with industry and other stakeholders to develop these standards. FinTechs could then voluntarily submit their technologies to this certifying organization to verify conformance to the applicable standards. In turn, banks could rely on this certification to efficiently onboard the vendor. Although my time at the FDIC is ending in 24 hours about, I continue to encourage the agency and our regulatory partners to pursue this initiative. Another key aspect of our pro-competition agenda has been modernizing a broad range of our rules while maintaining our core safety and soundness focus. Implementation of Senate Bill S-2155, modernizing our broker deposit rules, simplifying the VOCA rule, and tailoring application of enhanced prudential standards were among the FDIC's many achievements in recalibrating our rules to strike the proper balance between safety and soundness and promoting economic growth and innovation. We also took other steps to, uh, to promote good governance. For example, we established a new office of supervisory appeals to hear appeals by banks of supervisory determinations made by examiners. Over the past few months, the banking agencies have focused intently on crypto assets. While activity in crypto markets has exploded in recent years, banks' engagement in such activity remains limited despite substantial demand. A key reason for this lack of engagement by banks is legal and regulatory uncertainty and the need for supervisory clarity. In November, the banking agencies issued a joint statement laying out a roadmap for work the agencies plan to complete in 2022. I urge the agencies to continue pushing forward with this work and to focus on articulating policies that give banks and the public a clear understanding of supervisory expectations. One work stream has focused on bank issued stable coins, which could provide for faster, cheaper and more efficient ways to move money from place to place. 
A key question that the FDIC has been carefully exploring is whether a stablecoin or the funds represented by a stablecoin meets the definition of deposit under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, and relatedly, whether stablecoins could be eligible for deposit insurance. These are critical questions with major ramifications for the evolution of stablecoins. My personal view is that generally, bank-issued stablecoins closely resemble digital representation of deposits. I urge the FDIC to build off the work we have done and provide clarity to the public as soon as practicable, which could include promulgating amendments to the deposit insurance rules. With respect to the broader interagency stablecoin work, I encourage the agencies to be mindful of the many possible iterations of stablecoins we may see and to avoid a one-size-fits-all approach. For example, the regulatory framework for a GSIB issuing stablecoins may need to be very different from that of a $1 billion bank. Likewise, a bank experimenting with stablecoins as a small percentage of its business likely warrants a different regulatory approach from a bank whose sole business is stablecoin issuance. I have placed great emphasis during my tenure on inclusion, both in our financial system and at the FDIC. Two weeks ago, in collaboration with the National Bankers Association, I delivered a speech on why regulators must think outside the box in order to advance diversity and inclusion across financial services and inside the agencies. In the interest of time, I will not repeat those remarks here, but will mention two things I'm especially proud of. The creation of the mission-driven bank fund to drive capital investments and other funding to support low and moderate income minority and rural communities, and the cultural shift at the FDIC to make sure that our workforce feels heard, valued, and appreciated. I encourage those interested in more details on how we were able to achieve that, uh, um, what many actually have considered uh, and described as impossible to actually look at that speech. Three and a half years ago, I assumed the chairmanship of the FDIC determined to support the American dynamism that allows someone like me to reach my highest potential in this country. Not a day passed by when I did not think about how rare, perhaps unthinkable, it would be in many countries for a foreign born girl with a hard to pronounce name, no money and no connections to someday become chairman of an important federal government agency. But 30 years ago, this foreign born girl made a journey to the best, likely the only country in the world where that would be possible. Guided by a firm belief that the role of government in our society is to promote, not inhibit growth and innovation, I challenged myself and the FDIC staff to think outside the box to support a thriving, competitive, and innovating banking system that will continue to propel this nation forward. In closing, as our American values, culture, and influence face increasing competition from abroad, the FDIC has demonstrated that with ingenuity and agility, we can support an innovative banking system that allows our banks to continue to be the nurseries of national wealth while enabling more people to benefit from it. None of these achievements would have been possible without the committed staff of the FDIC who have my profound gratitude. I'm humbled by their dedication to the FDIC's mission and honored to have served with them. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions now.